Everybody, I'm sure, has heard about vitamins. Uh, vitamins are probably the most publicized aspect of nutritional elements. Uh, but minerals, a lot of people don't realize, minerals are equally or even more important than vitamins because in, uh, for a certain little biochemical quirk, for example, most vitamins function as what they call coenzymes, meaning they work in conjunction with various enzymes in the body. That's how they work. Most vitamins, not all, but most vitamins work that way. Minerals are enzyme activators. Most of them are enzyme, act enzyme activators. What that means is if you have a deficiency in the minerals, the enzyme uh, that they interact with will not be activated, and the vitamins that work with those enzymes won't do anything. So you have to ensure that you get enough minerals. Now, in recent years, uh, uh, certain minerals have been have garnered more publicity than others. Uh, examples of that include calcium. Uh, calcium is a, a lack of calcium is associated with a bone thinning disease, affects mostly women, called osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is a thinning of the bones. It begins actually around age 30, believe it or not. Uh, it's, uh, osteoporosis is caused by a combination of lack of sufficient dietary calcium, lack of uh, sufficient estrogen activity, and third uh, factor is lack of weight-bearing exercise. The type of women most prone to osteoporosis are, sm are small women with small bones. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to go into the nuances of osteoporosis, but you know, because of that, calcium has attracted a lot of attention. Uh, then you have magnesium. I've done several videos on magnesium. It's a mineral that's particularly important to anyone involved in fitness and health. It activates over 300 enzymes. It's involved in the activation of ATP or adenosine triphosphate, which is the most elemental source of energy in cells. Uh, magnesium uh, stabilizes creatine and ATP. It's involved in amino acid metabolism, fat metabolism. It's involved in uh, nerve conduction, uh, relaxation, sleep onset. Again, I've done previous videos of magnesium. I'm just pointing out there's been a lot of information about magnesium. Iron uh, uh, is another big mineral. Iron, a lack of iron causes a certain type of uh, def uh, uh, anemia. Uh, iron deficiency is more likely to occur in women because of menstrual cycles where they lose blood. Uh, and women also don't like to eat foods that contain the most assimilable form of iron, which is called heme iron. This is stuff like animal protein foods, but especially red meat. Iron exists in various fruits and vegetables, especially vegetables. Unfortunately, vegetables also contain compounds, which I've written about in my applied metabolics, called anti-nutrients which are natural substances that lock onto minerals and they literally prevent them from be absor being absorbed. They literally push them right out of the body. Uh, and the type of iron found in um, vegetables is called non-heme iron. It's not as absorbable as the heme iron found in animal protein foods like red meat. However, if, if you take vitamin C with a non-heme iron source, uh, the non-heme iron is, in convert is actually converted into heme iron. And most vegetables actually contain their own vitamin C, so it's not really a major problem. You know, then you have the all-important trace minerals, which aren't as, uh, some of them are more spoken of than others. For example, zinc. Zinc is pretty popular among bodybuilders and those involved in fitness because, again, zinc is involved in amino acid metabolism, uh, fat metabolism. Uh, it's also involved in hormone metabolism. It's needed for the synthesis of testosterone and insulin, and it helps. Uh, it's involved in the storage and release of growth hormone. So zinc is also a very important mineral. Uh, but there's certain lesser minerals, if you want to call it trace minerals, that you only need in very tiny amounts that are almost never spoken about. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today, one of these minerals. And this mineral is called molybdenum. Molybdenum is a trace mineral. Uh, and uh, you, you see it in certain supplements. People never even notice it. <laughs> I'm sure most of you have probably never even noticed that, that it's there. Uh, but it is an essential mineral. It's just as essential as iron and magnesium. Uh, the main function of mol molybdenum, it, and it actually only has a kind of, compared to the other minerals, I mean, you have like magnesium activates 300 enzymes, and I mean, zinc activates 300 enzymes. Molybdenum only activates four enzymes, but these four enzymes are extremely important for health. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, but um, 
the uh, it, it, the problem with well, if you want to call it a problem, uh, your body doesn't absorb molybdenum as well from certain foods, particularly soy products. The uh, molybdenum in soy products is only fifty seven percent available, but uh, you know there's so many foods that contain molybdenum. Uh, unless you live entirely on soy, it's not a problem. Uh, the uh, as far as uh, uh, deficiencies go, it, it's very rare. In fact. Um, there's only been one case, I think, in the medical literature of a human that suffered from a molybdenum deficiency, and this was a 24-year-old male patient who had intestinal disease called Crohn's disease, and he was receiving long-term parenteral nutrition. In other words, he was getting all his food from an IV. Uh, he couldn't eat because of the intestinal problem. After a couple of months, he developed nausea, rapid breathing, and heart rate, vision problems, and he went into a coma. Uh, the, uh, the test showed that he had very high levels of the amino acid methionine, low serum uric acid, and high urinary theosulfate, which led to his team to suggest that it's a molybdenum deficiency. They added uh, molybdenum to his parenteral nutrition, and he was fine. The only other time that you get a molybdenum deficiency is with certain rare genetics and enzymes that produce something called the molybdenum cofactor, uh, which is synthesized through a multi-step process. Uh, sometimes you get muta mutations in, in any of the uh, molybdenum cofactor enzymes that can result in inadequate, inadequate activity of all molybdenum enzymes. Uh, so the, uh, it's very, very rare. It only occurs in estimated 100,000 to 200,000 live births. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying you shouldn't worry about, well, you shouldn't worry about molybdenum. But I'm saying is that it, it, you have to really go out of your way to become deficient in it. But uh, what exactly does it do? Well, among other things, it, uh, hold on. Let's talk about the foods that contain molybdenum. It's uh, very high in beans, particularly, uh, uh, what's the name? The uh, lima beans have the highest amount of molybdenum. Small white beans, red beans, green beans, pinto beans, and peas. Grains contain molybdenum, including wheat, oat, and rice. And, and certain vegetables such as asparagus, dark leafy vegetables, and brassica vegetables uh, such as uh, broccoli have some good amount of magne uh, the molybdenum. The amount of molybdenum in these foods varies according to the type of soil that the food is uh, grown in. Uh, milk and cheese has uh, doesn't have a lot of molybdenum, but it actually is the primary source of molybdenum for younger people. It accounts for 27 to 40 percent. 47% of intake in younger people. Uh, for, for adults, grain products is the primary source, which accounts for 90 to 20% of all intake of, mal uh, of molybdenum. So uh, now what? Now why, why do we need molybdenum? I mentioned that it's needed to activate four enzymes. Uh, some of the minerals are stored in the liver and kidneys, but most of it is con uh, converted into the molybdenum cofactor that, that I mentioned earlier. In other words, the, the oral magnesium that you uh, ingest is converted to this molybdenum cofactor, as it's called. Any, S, any excess molybdenum is, the, is then excreted out of the body, and it, it activates, as I said, four enzymes. But these are very important, though. One of the enzymes is called sulfite oxidase. This converts sulfite into sulfate. And that's important because if you have uh, uh, a buildup of sulfites in the body is considered very toxic. Another enzyme that uh, molybdenum activates is aldehyde oxidase. This breaks down aldehydes, which can also be very toxic, and, and, uh, the, uh, uh, and it helps the liver break down alcohol in some drugs, such as those used in cancer therapy. Uh, xanthine oxidase is what converts xanthine to uric acid. This reaction helps break down nucleotides, the building blocks of DNA, when they're no longer needed. Uh, if you don't, uh, if this enzyme isn't working, you get uh, you get a substance called hypoxanthine, which builds up in the body, which can actually cause you know cell mutations and stimulate cancer. Um, the fourth enzyme that's activated by molybdenum is called the mitochondrial aminodoxine reducing component, or MARC. No, not, not much is known about this, but it, it's thought to remove toxic products of, of uh, met, uh, metabolism. Uh, it, was just, it was just identified a couple of years ago. Uh, it reduces uh, what they call N-hydroxylated compounds, such as amino oxanes to amidines. 
you know, I don't want to get into this. It's too, it's too, uh, too complex. But let's say that it, it reduces toxic uh, uh, substances. Uh, the, but the uh, molybdenum, the effect on breaking down sulfite is especially important because sulfites are found naturally in food and it's sometimes added. If you look, you see in a lot of foods, you'll see sulfite, uh, a form of sulfite added as a preservative. If they build up in the body, they can trigger aller- allergic reactions that can cause diarrhea, skin problems, breathing difficulties, or a decrease in beneficial microbiome bacteria. So this xanthine oxidase, I mean the sulfate oxidase, is a very important enzyme. So even though molybdenum only activates four enzymes, they're all very important enzymes. Uh, as I said, molybdenum deficiency is very rare. The estimated average daily in, uh, intake of molybdenum in the United States is 76 micrograms for women, 109 micrograms for men. This exceeds the uh, the recommended daily allowance, which is only 45, mil- 45 micrograms a day for adults. Uh, so the uh, in a small region of China, esophageal cancer is 100 times more common th- than in the U.S., it's been discovered that the soil in that, in that area has very low levels of molyb- molybdenum, resulting in a long-term di- low dietary intake. So that gives you an idea. As I mentioned, some of the enzymes that are activated by molybdenum help prevent cancer. So a long-term deficiency theoretically could stimulate types of cancer like esophageal uh, cancer. And o- other areas that have a high risk of esophageal cancer, such as parts of northern Iran and South Africa, uh, molybdenum levels in the hair and nail, sample, na- nail samples of people living there have been found to be low. So uh, the um, one interesting thing about molybdenum as far as clinical uses, it's been used to treat something called Wilson's disease. Uh, Wilson's disease is an excess of copper that builds up. Copper is another trace mineral. If you don't have enough copper, you can get a form of anemia, if you don't get enough copper, the aorta, the large uh, artery uh, leading away from the heart, can break down. Uh, and if that breaks down, you're dead. You're a dead man walking or dead woman walking. Uh, copper is, really is nothing to worry about. Because, uh, in fact, the big worry about copper is getting too much rather than too little. It's found in all protein foods, especially high in meat. But in some, uh, in this Wilson's disease, see, copper is normally bound to a protein called cerulea pl- plasm that circulates in the blood. As long as copper is attached to the protein, it's basically harmless. But if it if it gets disassociated from cerulea pl- plasma, it becomes a very potent prooxidant, meaning it increases oxidative reactions. And f- and for that reason, excess copper has been implicated in. And, the, and causing brain degenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So uh, molybdenum uh, actually can form a complex with excess copper and, and help the body get rid of it. And for that reason, molybdenum has been used to treat Wilson disease, which again involves an accumulation of copper due to lack of uh, uh, enough cereal plasma or, or too much free copper in the body. Uh, as far as toxicity goes, uh, as I said, uh, the potential for molybdenum toxicity in humans is very low. Uh, in Armenia, uh, the soil concentrations of molybdenum are unusually high, and intakes of 10 to 15 milligrams a day have been associated with aching joints, gout-like symptoms, uh, ele- huge amounts of ure- uric acid excreted out of the body, and elevated blood molybdenum levels. Uh, there was a one case study where molybdenum supplements were taken at 300 to 800 micrograms a day, and that, uh, but I don't know why anybody would take that much, but it led to hallucinations and seizures. Most of the uh, toxicity studies have been conducted in rodents. Uh, so, uh, so as I said, there you know you you only need uh, the upper limit for uh, molybdenum. The safe upper limit is 2,000 micrograms a day. And remember, the toxicity symptoms began with milligram amounts, and 1,000 micrograms equal one milligram. So the upper limit for molybdenum oral intake is basically two milligrams a day. You don't want to get more than that. If As long as you're getting two milligrams, you're fine. Uh, uh, let's see, what can I say? Uh, some, some research shows that if you take excess molybdenum, you can get reproductive difficulties including reduced fertility in men. It, it'll show reduced sperm count. Uh, 
So also, and this is of interest to bodybuilders and fitness enthusiasts, too much molybdenum in the blood has been linked to decreased testosterone levels. If you combine it with low zinc levels, it was linked with a 37% reduction in testosterone levels. So <laughs> I think that's about it for molybdenum. But the, the point being here is that uh, molybdenum is one of those minerals that nobody talks about, but you can see it's very important. And this is the key with minerals is that you don't want to get too much and you don't want to get too, li too little. In medicine and biology, they call this effect hormesis meaning a small or a moderate amount of anything will have favorable, favorable health benefits, but once you go past that amount, the effect reverses and starts to become toxic, and that includes anything from nutrients to certain foods to even exercise. Everyone knows that, you know, I mean, they've talked about this many times, a certain amount of exercise will help you build your muscle, increase your strength. If you go too much, meaning if you slip into overtraining, it starts to reverse and you could wind up either not making any muscle strength gains or actually lose muscle. So that's about it for molybdenum. Uh, if <laughs> molybdenum. Yeah, it's nothing to worry about. If, if any of you, if you take a, uh, a vitamin mineral, you know, vitamin mineral pills tend to be very, very rich in vitamins. They give you really good amount of vitamins they tend to become skimpy they tend to be skimpy on the minerals though because minerals take up a lot more space than vitamins so to give you a full complement of minerals and in, in a vitamin mineral pill the the uh, pill would be probably the size of a baseball you wouldn't be able to swallow it so they put in small amounts of minerals but but good amounts of vitamins and but the molybdenum is needed in such small amounts that almost any vitamin mineral you take is going to have all you need, all the molybdenum you need. Uh, you know, so you don't have to worry about molybdenum. If you, but if you want more information about nutrition, exercise science, anti-aging research, effective fat loss techniques, ergogenic aids, hormonal therapy, uh, uh, supplement science, which supplements work, which ones don't, subscribe and women's health and fitness. I I don't forget women. I have a lot of information for women in applied metabolics. And by the way, most of what I write about related to nutrition and exercise applies to both sexes. In other words, women could do uh, you know, could use some of the same information. And in some cases, it has to be slightly modified for women because of, let's say, hormonal and structural differences. But most of the information in applied metabolics is just as applicable to women as it is to men. So subscribe today, www.appliedmetabolics.com. When you subscribe, send me an email. I'll send you an uh, invitation to join my private Applied Metabolics Facebook page where each day I, I, I post new information on on nutrition, medicine, and general health. I have an email portal on my Applied Metabolics webpage where current subscribers only could send me any short questions related to anything they read in Applied Metabolics or anything that comes to mind related to nutrition and health. I will answer that as a uh, measure of gratitude, let's say, for, that, for your subscription to Applied Metabolics. Uh, needless to say, if you're not a subscriber, well, You'll be whistling in the wind. <laughs> what can I say? I, I only have time to answer current subscribers. So uh, again, www.appliedmetabolics.com. You won't be sorry because that, that publication also includes my over 60 years of constant study and, exp and, and actual real-world experience, which can't be matched by anyone else producing a digital publication. And no one can match my level of experience. I don't care how many years they went to school or how many PhDs they have. Certain things you just don't learn in school. You have to learn in the real world. And all of that's included in Applied Metabolics. So again, www.appliedmetabolics.com. There's no ads. It's 30 to 45 pages every month uh, and uh, comes out on the first of the month. So subscribe today. Uh, and uh, if you want to have the best friend you'll ever have, go to your local shelter, adopt a dog. Thank you for listening.